Social media has been going insane over this recent article on fish oil and cardiovascular disease. So today in the podcast, we're going to talk all about that. Let's get started. Welcome back, everybody, to the Building Lifelong Athletes podcast. For those stopping by, I really appreciate it. For those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Jordan Renicki, and I'm a dual board certified physician in family and sports medicine. And the goal of this podcast is to help keep you active and healthy for life through actionable, evidence informed education. Today, we're talking all about fish oil use and cardiovascular disease, like I mentioned. So let's dive into it. So, kind of get some background here. Initially, this is the paper we're looking at here. It's titled Regular Use of Fish Oil Supplements and Course of Cardiovascular Disease prospective cohort study. And this was in the BMJ, British Medical Journal. So a pretty prestigious journal. And this has been making the rounds all over social media. I've seen a bunch of people talk about this saying, oh, you shouldn't take fish oil because it's so confusing, right? You hear some people say, yeah, you should take fish oil. Then people say, no, you shouldn't. And then you point this article and they don't do. So I'm going to break it down kind of how I read this, right? How I go through this, how I attack it, what my kind of thoughts are about this paper. So we're going to dive in right here. And this is recent as well, just on April 2024. So hopefully just in time. So introduction here. The big takeaway point is that cardiovascular disease matters, right? That's why we care about this. Cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death worldwide. One in six deaths in the UK. This was published in the British Medical Journal. So we're talking about, you know, Britain and the UK. So that's important. So one in six deaths, though, cardiovascular disease. And fish oil, just taking a step back, fish oil is a source of omega-3 fatty acids. So it's a type of fat. You can have either EPA or DHA. There's much longer names, but EPA, DHA are kind of the two main ones. And there's a general thought that these may help prevent cardiovascular disease. However, the data is actually pretty controversial. There's some people say it's beneficial, say you need it. Um, it decreases heart disease. It's you know part of your nutrient stack. You should have these in your vitamins, yada, yada. While other studies show like no improvement and may actually increase atrial fibrillation. And so the general recommendations right now, like from the big cardiology societies are, the only time we're really recommending fish oil is for when we have specifically a tri hypertriglyceridemia or something like that. We're using prescription uh, strength for that. But... Overall, there's lots of people take it because they say they should. And so we're going to kind of dive in here to this paper and talk all about that. But this is the first thing first, like why we actually care about it, because cardiovascular disease actually matters. From a study design perspective, this was a longitudinal cohort study looking at AFib and cardiovascular disease. And they want to look at the progression uh, in the nature of cardiovascular disease, meaning people, if they were healthy when they progressed AFib, how many of them progressed to MACE or major adverse cardiovascular event or to death? So that's essentially what we're looking at here. They're thinking, hey, this might be a spectrum where you're healthy, and then AFib, then MACE, which cardiovascular event is something like a heart attack or stroke, and then leading to death. So on this spectrum, can we intervene and prevent that? And this was a longitudinal cohort study looking at, like I said, AFib, MACE, all cause death, and those with no known cardiovascular disease or those who were at high risk. So at the start, though, they did not have cardiovascular disease. This used the UK Biobank, which is a huge data set of like 500,000 UK inhabitants who were between the ages of 40 and 69. This was between 2006 and 2010 when they were recruiting. And then to be excluded, if you had pre-existing AFib, heart failure, history of stroke, or heart attack, or you had cancer, then you'd be excluded, which makes sense, right? We want healthy people to start. So this left us with about 415,000 participants. And then how we figured out the fish oil was being consumed, this is actually a self-report questionnaire. And, you know, say what you want about self-report questionnaires, but that's kind of the nature of the beast, right? If we want to do a huge study like this with 400 some thousand people, then we have to make some concessions. And one of those is going to be, we have to go on self-report data. That's just how it works. And so fish consumption, the fish oil consumption was based on self-reported questionnaires and then grouped people into the fish oil or non-fish oil users. And then these people were followed up until death, lost the follow-up or ending of the study in 2021. And there were a bunch of covariates they try to con control for things like age, sex, ethnic group, smoking status, alcohol consumption. And then they also got dietary data looking at fatty fish consumption as well, meaning, hey, maybe those people ate additional fat as well. So they tried to, you know, contribute to that and try to look for that. And all right, let's do the study group breakdowns now. So in this, statistically, they broke this down into multiple transition points or six main ones. And this is looking at essentially these people who are the baseline healthy and going to AFib, then healthy to MACE, healthy to death, and then AFib to MACE, AFib to death, and then MACE to death. That's a lot of acronyms. So essentially looked at people who are healthy and the transition to AFib to MACE or the myocardial infarction, heart attack or stroke, and then healthy to death. And then we had people who had AFib, how, you know, was the progression to either heart attack or stroke and then AFib again to death. And then once again, MACE, either people had a stroke or heart attack and the progression to death. They kind of looked at all those things and they even broke down MACE even more to MI stroke and heart failure. And they tried to correct for multiple different things like urban versus rural, BMI, physical activity. They kind of grouped into high, medium, low, binge drinking, dietary intakes of veggies, fruit, and red meat. So lots of things they were looking for there. And specifically, they're looking at this breakdown. That's kind of interesting to me. Like we'll talk about the results here in a second, but it was kind of interesting looking at these transition points. Points, right they're kind of saying hey it might be different from one point to another so that's kind of why they broke it down and said hey a perfectly healthy person might be different than someone who's had a heart attack already so would it be unique there so that's kind of what they're looking for from the results perspective let's look at it here 
Overall, fish oil increased the risk of AFib, but otherwise lowered cardiovascular disease and death. And I'm going to stop right there. You're like, well, that makes no sense. And it is a confusing one for sure. But overall, the trend seemed that fish oil increased AFib risk, but otherwise lowered cardiovascular. So let's look a little deeper here. 31% of people total reported regular fish oil supplementation. And from the fish oil group, they did have a higher proportion of elderly, white um, folks, women, alcohol use, and oily and non-oily fish consumption and lower smoking. So in general, these people were a little bit older, tend to be white, females. They did use more alcohol, but also consumed more fish in general. And from a healthy status, fish oil had a harmful effect on AFib with a hazard ratio of 1.13, so about a 13% increase in the odds of getting atrial fibrillation, but it didn't seem to increase MACE or death. Whereas if you were in the AFib group, fish oil decreased the risk of MACE with a hazard ratio of 0.92, so meaning about an 8% reduction in MACE. Um, and there's borderline positive effects on death, which weren't like statistically significant. And so I kind of want to walk through this results table here, right here. And it's kind of this big table, big breakdown here. I won't go into depth what it is, but you can kind of see these transition patterns, right? So these baseline to AFib, baseline to MACE, baseline death, kind of what we're looking here. And how we look at these, if you're watching the video here, is here, this number of events column, this is the total number of events, right? So we had going to atrial fibrillation, 18,000-ish or so. And then here's this hazard ratio. So hazard ratio is a big thing. This is pretty much saying a hazard ratio of one means that like there's no risk. It's kind of like neutral. We don't think there. If there's something below one, that means there's a, a chance that it actually improves things. And if it's above one, that means it's a higher risk. So when we see a hazard ratio of 1.13, that means there's a 13% increased risk of atrial fibrillation. And that only is the case if this p-value is less than 0.05. And the p-value less than 0.05 gives us what we call statistical significance, meaning, hey, we think that there's actually signals to the noise. So if something were above 0.05, that would mean, hey, we don't think that statistically we can confidently say this is actually what's happening. Because what that's telling us is that means there's a you know greater than 95% chance that the numbers that we see are actually true. And that's what we're kind of the benchmark we use in science to say, hey, we think this is clinically important and it actually matters. And so if it's less than 0.05, we say, yep, or 0.05, we say, yep, that's good. It's significant. And you can see that's definitely the case there. And you can kind of walk through these. I'm not going to walk through each one here, but you see, you know, 1.0, 0 0.98 but none of these are really kind of reaching significance other than here, you know, atrial fibrillation going to MACE, it looks like 0.92, that 8% decrease. And oh, look at that, the P value is significant. So this is why we're saying an 8% reduction when you have AFib going to MACE, whereas up here we have a 13% increase when we go from regular to atrial fibrillation. So that's just kind of an overarching thing, what's going on. I, I think overline the baseline to AFib, baseline to stroke, those were the only real metrics that showed any sort of relative risk. So going from a baseline AFib or stroke, everything else was like neutral or positive for fish oil, which is, I thought, very interesting. And so, you know, kind of breaking it down here, I'd like to talk about the discussion. You know, overall, there's kind of found a differential role for fish oil. You know, healthy people showed an increased risk of AFib. And, but if you had AFib or MACE, then fish oil had a kind of protective effect or no effect on MACE or death. And so the question is, how can fish oil show different results based on different groups? Why the paradox? And let's be clear, we don't know. Like This is a huge study. I love it. It's great when you see hundreds of thousands of people, but in no way, shape, or form can we determine like causality from this, You know, meaning what's going on. I think it could be dose-related, me meaning that maybe higher doses of fish oil cause atrial fibrillation. We don't know. You know. There's been previous studies that showed higher concentrations of fish oil may inhibit, inhibit something called the sodium potassium ATPase activity, which is um, can disrupt the, the sodium potassium ATPase is really important for maintaining the correct chemical gradient inside the your all your cells, but specifically inside your heart and your myocytes. And if that's abnormal, that can lead to weird electrical conduction is how I'll say that. And so could be responsible for messing up that gradient and could play a role in atrial fibrillation. Once again, that is very like, maybe, maybe mechanistically, we don't definitively know. And so we do not know why this is the case. That just seems to be the data in this specific instance. But this is not the first time a study has been showing that a, you know, AFib could be associated with fish oil. So that's something we have to consider about. And now let's talk about strength limitations, which I think is always a fun thing to talk about. Strengths, lots of people, right? This was a huge study and it was a long-term study going from 2005, six to 2020, 21. So I love that. That's fantastic. That is like what we want, you know, very, a lot of people in a very long time. So good study. I love that. Weaknesses, as with all cohort studies, lots of limitations. So unknown amount of DHA or EPA or anything like that, dose may play a big role in the side effects. And we've mentioned that before, that maybe people were taking a butt ton of fish oil with the ones inducing AFib. That's possible. We don't have the dosing. They tried to kind of figure out with fish, you know, consumption as well, but there's no way of knowing how much someone's taking, right? They're not keeping a journal. It's just overall, did you take fish oil or not? And that's what it's going for. You know, this was a self-reported questionnaire. So also had no idea if diet was consistent over that time period. Someone might've said, yeah, like, Hey, 
I took fish oil and then, you know, how regularly do they take it? They were taking it during the time of the survey, but not after. So we're not sure. And did people's diet really change at all over that time? Not sure. Once again, observational, which means we cannot draw um, causation from this. And then also they used AFib. They did this on hospital records, right? So essentially someone comes to the hospital, they get diagnosed with AFib. They're chart reviewing through these electronic medical records saying, okay, this person who did not have AFib, but now has a new AFib diagnosis and looking through that, did they, you know, do they take fish oil? They kind of separate it out, but that doesn't include like people go on AFib for other reasons, right? It's not necessarily a fish oil consumption. You know, just the other day I had a patient with a pneumonia come in and they flipped in AFib and that, that happens, right? When you get sick, sometimes that can happen. So it could have been brought on by sickness or surgery. So it doesn't necessarily account for all those things. And so I just want to say, Hey, that's something we need to think about that. There's lots of limitations and overall though going to some takeaways here i'd love to kind of talk about this it looks like fish oil may increase the risk of afib but otherwise does not seem to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease and i think if i had to like say you know you're saying hey you need to make a decision on fish oil i'd say if you're taking fish oil maybe err on the lower side instead of mega doses you know sometimes we get up there with some pretty hefty doses for people who are you know with cardiovascular disease or try you know hypertrichosidemia things like that but if you're taking fish oil i wouldn't just like start slamming pills right like handfuls of fish oil i think if you're going to do that it's an informed decision kind of you know look think about the risks and benefits go out from there but either way i just wanted to like run over like this is how i read through that and kind of understood it that, Hey, like sometimes science doesn't make perfect sense. And this definitely does not. When I look at this, I'm not like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Like healthy, not like, no, I do not. That doesn't, I'm not going to pretend to understand that, but science is important either way. Good things, bad things, weird things, confusing things. It's helpful. It all kind of fits into a picture. And, and I like to say, I'm all about evidence and form education because, um, you know, when you see this, you can make a decision like, okay, what does this mean for me? And so um, that's kind of where I'm thinking how I fit in this, the picture where, you know, it doesn't seem like it's the boogeyman, but also I wouldn't say it's necessarily benign that there's no side effects to it. And once again, every sort of intervention that's worth taking will have side effects. And so we'll see. It's kind of where you fit in this. It depends on your personal beliefs and what you think kind of where the evidence lies. And I just, showing you how I read an article, how I interpret it and to not get blown away. And I just, hopefully this gives you a little more clarity. And you know, when you see social media, it says like, it's bad for you, it gives you cardiovascular disease. Like it very clearly does not give you like standard cardiovascular disease, maybe AFib, but like not the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease we talk about. So that's just kind of the step back there. But overall, this does conclude the podcast. Thanks so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. If you found this helpful, it would mean a lot if you left a five-star review on your favorite podcast platform of choice, or if you share with a friend who might enjoy it. And if you never want to miss any content, consider signing up for my mailing list, which is linked in the description below. I'll send out content uh, that I release during the week so you never miss anything. And I promise I'll never spam you because I hate that. But that's it for today. So get off your phone, go be active, have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time.